Good day. I'm Howard Krieger, CEO of Residual Token, Inc., a leading Web3 advisory company. I'm going uh, sans background today because I'm wearing a green shirt and everything kind of blended together. I look like a floating head, but let's get right to it. So uh, today we're going to look at uh, FSB, the uh, Financial Stability Board's 2020 paper on the regulation, supervision, and oversight of global stablecoin arrangements. Now, we're going back to 2020. And what's interesting here is that as we go through this document, you'll see references to things that um, could happen and risks that could occur that uh, in reality uh, ultimately did happen uh, in some of the financial markets. When we think about some of the de-pegging we've seen um, and and tokens and stable coins that have uh, gone uh, the way of the, the dodo bird. Um, but with that in mind, there's still a ton of relevant information here that uh, establishes a framework for stable coin regulation uh, internationally. And what I particularly like about this uh, report was the breadth of the survey that was conducted at the time, um, the examination of other jurisdictional uh, regulations that um, were were being conceived and have since either moved or stagnated, uh, but then also just the the idea of getting out of the U.S. jurisdiction, that, that when you think about the actual application and use of stable coins for payments or cash management, um, that in a lot of cases, the appeal of a, of a stable coin that's pegged to a currency um, can be uh, much safer and less volatile than, say, the native uh, jurisdictional currency. And it's, it, and it's working to mitigate the risks associated with those use cases, where someone's going to be buying a loaf of bread or a gallon of milk um, or paying their rent um, using these things as opposed to, uh, say, in more affluent countries where this might just be like a payment mechanism um, in lieu of a credit card or writing a check or something like that. So I want to get right to it. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Dun, 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 dun. Here we go. Do, do, do. And voila. Okay. So um, again, Financial Standard Board. Oh, uh, just some notes, right? I'm not an attorney. I'm not a tax person. I'm not an accountant. Um, everything I discuss is based on my background. You can check it out on LinkedIn, Howard J. Krieger. Um, a little bit of banking, a little bit of Web3, a little bit of accounting firm. Um, and then just ob obviously my experience having read through a bunch of these at this point. Um, also, this is all publicly available information. So if you want to take a look at uh, these uh, write-ups, it's just, you know, Google regulation, supervision, and oversight of global stablecoin arrangements from the FSB. And you could read along at home and, and cut these out, hang them up in your locker. Um, I have already gone through and marked up what I think are uh, just pertinent and important passages, again, subject to my bias. Uh, there's more information in here than I'm going to cover. Uh, and in fact, we probably stop about two thirds way through the document because there's just a lot of detail and annexes. Super important information. If you're in the space, if you are a corporate treasurer and you're being asked how stable coins can work for you, if you're at a fund and you're trying to think of like a safe settlement token or an exchange token, these are the kinds of things you want to be thinking about. So um, here you go. The FSB. First thing I did is I went to Wikipedia and find out what the FSB is. International body. Its members volunteer to follow the guidelines that are in the, the material that comes out of FSB. These guys don't, it's not like a central authority. Uh, in, in essence, the G20, right? The uh, kind of the large 20 largest economies in the world. I think that's what comprises the G20. They use entities like the FSB to sort of um, kind of execute and complete tasks that come out of issues the G20 raises. So in this case, the G20 raised concerns about stable coins and said, okay, FSB, go do some research, do some work, put together recommendations. They would be distributed to the G20, and then the G20 would give them to their legislators, and then the legislators, um, and, and then people from varying aspects, banking, securities, payments, et cetera, would then take those recommendations and either say, hey, you know, we already have laws that cover this stuff, or hey, there's a gap. It would be great to put a law there. So again, October 13th, 2020. 
uh, is when this report was compiled. Always look at the table of contents with these things. As I've said before, words have meaning, but when it comes to these types of write-ups, even when we look at the regulations that come out, the order of the words have meaning. So the things tend to get laid out either in sort of an introductory and storytelling fashion, if maybe the topic is novel, um, but for like mature topics, then the order becomes the prioritization, um, typically from regulators based off of risk. So they'll talk about like what they think are the biggest risks first, even if they don't um, come out and say it directly, uh, you can get a, a sense of what their approach is. So here with stable coins, they're talking about what the stabilization mechanism is, um, the potential reach and adoption, risks of uh, financial stability, international standards that could apply, cross-border challenges. You know, a lot of times when we look at digital assets and cryptocurrencies and stuff, we think about just the usage of them within, say, the four corners of a, of a state or a country. But the reality is, is that the cross-border transfer, because it's all cloud-based, um, poses a, a huge risk from a supervise, supervisory function and oversight, uh, especially if the headquarters that uh, of the foundation or whatever entity is sponsoring the digital asset uh, might be in a jurisdiction that has like low lower supervisory standards um, and uh, maybe is lackadaisical in enforcing the sharing of uh, that oversight, those oversight findings to other uh, supervisors in other countries outside of where the headquarters are. Um, okay, so la la la. Again, I've highlighted and gone through this already. Um, so, you know, here, and again, remember this is 2020. So now if you're watching this, you're probably in the Web3 space or like you're Web3 curious. And so something like stable coins, you wouldn't typically see in quotes, but in 2020, the term, um, what, you know, it's as nebulous then as it is now, but it just didn't exist. So that's why so-called it's, this is as so-called stable coins in quotes, right? Um, but it's a specific category that that uh, of of crypto asset that is whose value is either pegged to a reserve of underlying assets or is algorithmically uh, set. So the stable coins here are an attempt to address the high volatility of traditional crypto assets by tying the value to an asset like a sovereign currency or to some algorithm. If those stable coins uh, become widely adopted, they become global stable coins. Think of USDT, think of USDC. These are ones that are now considered global stable coins and pose all the risks that uh, are covered in this document. Um, the risks are many. Decentralized nature of, of the governance of the token. We think about governance meaning like who, who owns the smart contract or the master contract behind USDC? Who has the keys to that? Um, and who can affect change? Some stable coins are, are DAO-based where whole communities through voting can automatically change um, some of the features within the, the smart contract, uh, which poses a, a certain risk. The mechanism, redemption, market credit, really touches everything. Anything that touches a, a typical payment rail is going to be relevant here. So in June of 2019, G20 mandated uh, FSB to uh, examine the regulatory issues raised by GSCs, global stable coins. Um, and particularly, and this is really where I was like, I got to do this one, um, was the emerging market and developing economies. Uh, whenever I meet like Joe or Jane chewing tobacco on the street, they're always like, hey, what cryptocurrency should I buy? And this and that. And we, you know, we talk about, or someone's like, uh, you know, is Bitcoin going to replace the dollar? Well, you know, if, if, if a currency is a more volatile currency will never replace a less volatile currency. It's just inherent, the the risk, the increased risk that that is is observed through volatility decreases value. So risk and value are um, how do you say uh, directly uh, you know anti-correlated, right? Uh, where uh, the higher the risk, the lower the value. Uh, so it's not that they're uncorrelated. It's just that they move in opposite directions. 
And I'm sure there's a word for it and someone's going to put it in the comments and I apologize. So FSB carried out this survey, FSB members, non-FSB members, um, got a ton of responses. And this is the result of sort of the analysis of those uh, findings. The final report covers 10 high-level recommendations, which we're going to go over in just a minute. Um, and it calls for regulation, supervision, and oversight proportionate to the risk, but also making sure that flexibility and, and inclusivity uh, and multi-sector coordination occurs and information sharing so that you don't get a disproportionately risk-averse reaction um, that negatively, you know, impacts, say, a particular subset of users um, simply because folks didn't talk about what they were doing and they weren't being very public or transparent. And that's not just country to country, that's within a country, the different supervisory organizations. When you think in the U.S. about what the SEC mandates versus the the, the OCC or the Commodities uh, Board of Trade, uh, you, you know, like the, these these types of coordinated efforts are are important to not only kind of fill in all the gaps, but also make sure that there's not a disproportionate response negative towards one. And the key here they find is coordination is going to be key and something to look for. Where if if you do not see a lack of coordination, um, it's all it's very likely that whatever comes out of that entity that proposed a rule or passed a rule or guidance that was done without coordination um, will be sort of mitigated and and kind of relegated to the waste pile of history. Um, this report does not focus on AML, data, privacy, cyber, investor protection, and competition. It really is focused on financial stability. Uh, and that in general, authorities agree, and this is a good one, uh, th this idea globally of same business, same risk, same rules. So regardless of what country you're in, if the same business is occurring in that jurisdiction and the same risks are posed uh, to that business, then similar rules should be put into place um, so that you, you don't get arbitrage situations, you don't get people like purposely setting up shops in different jurisdictions because maybe the authority is a little uh, lighter um, in, in one versus the other. And again, the goal here is to uh, make sure that financial stability uh, is maintained at all times uh, and how GSCs kind of you know, this whole report is how GSEs threaten global uh, financial stability and the high level recommendations to uh, to address the challenges raised by these GSC arrangements. So let's run through these real quick, because this is the theme, right? And if you stop watching after this 10 lists, I completely understand. Um, there is more data behind it, but these are the key takeaways, right? That the FSB's recommendation is that authorities should have the power to enforce the laws and regulations effectively. You make a law, you have to be able to enforce it. Authorities should also keep in mind relevant international standards to GSC arrangements on a functional basis and proportionate to their risks. So it's one of these things where do not come up with regs in a vacuum, but rather look at where international standards are. And if you want to be incrementally, you know, more risk averse because you just think like, hey, I got to protect my people more, that's great. But certainly don't put a rule or standard in place that creates an absolute contradiction um, or confusion because that would lead to potential financial instability. Authorities should cooperate and coordinate with each other domestically and internationally, effective communication so that the rules are consistent within a jurisdiction and then across jurisdiction. Comprehensive governance framework. This is a huge issue with uh, the, the stable coins that are existing today. And um, as we see new stable coins coming to market, that this idea of who actually controls the code that that creates the uh the stable coin but also the network that the stable coin is used on um and uh the the permission versus private blockchain the kyc the aml um and then also uh redemption rights and management of reserves that the the governance over the coin itself is something that the authorities should make sure 
that that governance mechanism has sufficient accountability to them because in essence, they're making new money, right? They're making digital money, maybe a digital marker re representing money, but it's still the same. It, it's still the same animal. And with a GSC, remember GSC means that they're globally, they're global stable coins, meaning at the point that um, there's an issue with a GSC, that means multiple jurisdictions and potentially millions of people could be affected. And as we saw with the banking crisis that happened years after this uh, rules were in effect, you saw how Silvergate and Signature and some of these other banks shut down because of their uh, overexposure to, in part, blockchain related entities, not necessarily a direct tie to a stable coin failing per se, um, but certainly uh, there, there were a series of dominoes that kind of lead back to some depegging and then vice versa. The failing of the banks led to other depegs because reserve assets were, were held there. Um, authorities should make sure that effective risk management's in place. Uh, authorities should make sure that there's uh, robust systems for collecting, storing, and safeguarding data because reporting and accountability is a huge part of the recommendation here. Um, and that the GSC has to have appropriate recovery and resolution plans. Servers go down in a certain country that all the information isn't lost, that it's somehow preserved either in the cloud or backed up somewhere else so that the 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 function of the GSC, which is again, either algorithmically to remain stable or pegged to a reserve asset, that that fundamentally doesn't break down just because a computer system is not available, not acceptable. Um, transparent information, including its stabilization mechanism uh, time and time again. And this is going to continue to be something that plagues us throughout the 2020s, is how transparent are the reserves? The issue becomes one of, well, you want to know that there's enough reserves so to to literally back the stable coin. Um, but publication around things like the the interest income on the reserves, um, the the timing of the buying and and selling of uh, the treasuries for redemptions can create signals in the marketplace which um, have an, the opposite effect. You, you think full disclosure would everyone would would treat the information that they receive through full disclosure the same way, right? The strong market hypothesis. But the reality is is that even the simple act of hey, a billion dollars is coming in, and so you if you saw that in real time and you knew in advance that now that billion in cash is going to go into buying treasuries, there's probably an arbitrage there. And so, um, which would actually make the purchase of the of, of the treasuries more costly, and then that, that might affect the peg. So there's a balance between transparency um, and, uh, and, and almost oversharing, if you will. Uh, the last piece so here is that you want to make sure that the redemption rights and process for redemption work and are, and are in place, uh, that redemption is real, because again, the, the risk of the token, and we see this years later when uh, Basel comes around, that the right and the rights associated with and the risks of holding a stable coin backed by reserve assets cannot be greater. That risk cannot be greater than holding the actual reserve itself. High bar to achieve. Um, and then here that the, the authorities should make sure that the, you know, the applicable rules in the specific jurisdiction where they intend to operate, uh, that they can do that. And that as new regulations come on board, the GSC is able to bend. This is a little, you know, this is where I say, like, look at the order, right? Like, if you're already gl a global stablecoin, odds are you've done so uh, within the confines and rules of your uh, your, your country. A nice glossary. They have asset link stable coin. We now call them RWAs. Crypto assets, they say, is a private digital asset. Here they separate digital asset and stable coin, where a digital asset represents a value for payment or investment purposes, but does not include digital representations for fiat currencies. Stable coins are a crypto asset that maintain a stable value relative to a specified asset pool or basket. So again, we kind of use, you, you know, um, 
sta a stable coin is a form of digital asset. Here, the FSB is saying separate. This goes back to that bigger rule. Oh, and they do talk about wallets, custody, and non-custody. This goes back to a bigger issue of nomenclature and just making sure that that like, you know, as the glossary evolves, we work towards standard definitions. And we're doing a good job of it, you know, for the most part. I do hear, you know, the obfuscation of certain like legal, like RWA, for instance, you know, in banking is risk weighted asset. And that's actually something that's used to, to mitigate risks. So when you have RWAs and there's an RWA for RWAs, very confusing and, and problematic. But that being said, that's the nature of the beast. When you have things developed in isolation uh, of the of the marketplace, uh, you, you know, you build something for use in a marketplace, and there, and there are not a, a lot of participants from that marketplace involved in the early stage development. You're gonna run into these issues. I had that challenge with with DeFi uh, years ago. We see with RWAs now. Um, risks we talked about really data privacy protection, financial integrity, etc. Um, the G20 mandate, you know, wanted to see about the risks, the specific challenges arising from cross-border context, uh, and, um, you know, here, how, how the risks differ from other crypto assets, first and foremost, right? Like, why, why do stable coins, like, what, what, what makes them special? Um, the focus of this report is really related to retail uses of stable coins. Uh, as opposed to like wholesale, like like a use of a stable coin, maybe for like uh, internal treasury management uh, or, or something like that. Uh, the wider monetary policy uh, and monetary sovereignty and currency substitution questions uh, are also out of the scope for the report. So here they're not coming up with the challenge of like, look, if I take a, I think it's a franc, a Zimbabwe franc, if I tokenize a Zimbabwe franc, it, I believe you cannot take fiat cash out of Zimbabwe or you couldn't years ago. But if you had a digital asset that was tied to the value of a Zimbabwe franc, then you could take that out. And what would that kind of substitution uh, do for the, the risk of the country's financial stability? Out of scope here. Um, it's also interesting to see who the FSB has worked with, IMF, World Bank, the Basel Committee, FATF. Uh, CPMI, which I had never heard of before this uh, write-up, and also the IOSCO, same thing. Hadn't read about it, but uh, you know, I'm I'm sure their mandate is is the same, right? Either it's always either the investor transparency or financial market stability or data privacy protection. Those are kind of your standards. The characteristics of a global stablecoin. The punchline here is that it's commonly enjoyed by many multiple market participants from different jurisdictions. That's what makes it global. The stable mechanism could be asset linked or algorithmic. Again, this is 2020. I don't know how many algorithmic stable coins we typically see now. I'm sure they're out there. I'm sure there's people trying to hawk them on the web. But for the most part, most of the stable coins that we're, that we're seeing advancing to that institutional next trillion dollars of investment phase are all asset linked. Um, and then the stable coin values in relation to that asset. Uh, do, 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 do. Th these core functions, this is really a great definition for stable coins. If you're doing a presentation at school and you got to talk about it, what do stable coins have to do? Here are the three core functions. They need to be issued, redeemable, and stabilized. They need the ability to be transferred, and there needs to be the ability to interact uh, between users storing and exchanging. So, so not a situation where you have, say, uh, a central authority uh, necessarily involved in the sending and receiving and storing of the coins. So if you check the box on these eight things, right? Issuance, one, two, seven things, then you are a stable coin. So commit that to memory, consider a light tattoo with these. Blah, 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 allows transactions without just a third party. We know this if you're in web three, that you're, you know, this is the key with stable coins that you're able to transfer it without uh, uh, intermediary. Uh, and it talks about th this table, the functions and activities in a stable coin arrangement. So the governance, right? The protocol for validating transactions is part of the governance, as well as the mechanism, the mechanism for the stabilization or anything inherent in the smart contract. That is governance. The issuance, redemption, and stabilization, who mints, who destroys, 
What are the what are the operational triggers for either of those things? Um, what are the protections against those things happening inadvertently? Uh, and the how is the management of the reserve um, kept in line with the management of the issuance and destruction of the coin itself? Right. What are the, those mechanisms? And those are mechanisms that that you want to understand when you are looking at a stable coin to use for your organization. Is that how does the reserve risk match with the stable coin risk? Um, and then, of course, access to the system and operating in infrastructure, including when things go sideways. When things go sideways, the question becomes how do how does this continue to work? in the market if um, the, the, the server or the website goes down. Reach and adoption, risks and vulnerabilities. GSEs may adversely affect financial stability. And this is this is where we get into it. And this is, when you see a highlight in a circle in one of my documents, oh boy, get back, you know it's coming. So potential risks of the financial stability. Wealth effects may be particularly pronounced in the emerging market and developing economies where the likelihood of GSEs becoming a mainstream store of value may be higher than in advanced economies. So the, the group of people that benefit from the stable nature of a stable token and its transportability and the ability to interact without having a financial intermediary are all great pros with a tremendous con associated with them. And that is if there is some breakdown in any of the things we're talking about, lights out. You could you could gut the entire you can you can gut an already poor economy with a poorly administered stable to token. And that's really where the, the, that is really where all these calls for regulations come from. I know a lot of folks that are like, you know, freedom loving, like, Hey, let's wild west this thing. Yeah. Set up a bunch of reserve assets and mint some tokens and call it a day. That's all well and good. Because if, if that fails and you have other methods to fall back on, you can mitigate the damage. There's a high possibility in an EMDE that if the stablecoin becomes the store of value, that you can't mitigate it, and that uh, that that's no good. So the other thing is that the exposure of financial institutions can increase in scale and change in nature. And this is interesting because again, this all happened before before Silvergate. And um, if you recall, there was a moment in the banking crisis where there was this run on USDC, where uh, which is a stablecoin uh, sponsored by the Circle Foundation, where. But again, because it's still a risk on asset, it may be backed, quote unquote, by reserves, but given the transparency and the lack of all the stuff mentioned here, there's a run. Well, if if the if the reserves for the token are stored at a bank and there's a run on the token, which is very easy to do, then there's going to be a run on those assets in the bank. The bank has to liquidate some of its securities that it might be in a negative position. And all of a sudden the bank's equity is destroyed. So there you have a direct link between the, the liquidating and redemption claim of a stable coin directly impacting the operations of a bank and ultimately leading to it, it being shut down. Now, imagine if the whole country was relying on this GSC, uh, you could have central banks fail uh, if, if that was the case, uh, because it might magnify confidence effects. So all of a sudden, people start getting weary of the financial system because this this one pillar uh, that got bigger and bigger and bigger and just proportionate to the risk um, uh, fell. Uh, disruptions to payments. So even if you don't have store of value, if the disruption to the payment mechanism happens, uh, you have implications for financial stability because vendors can't be paid, employees can't be paid. If they're relying on the GSC to be the method by which the transfer occurs, if it fails, uh, the and there's not a good substitute system, you could see run on banks um, you know, using fiat uh, simply because the payment mechanism of the GSC failed. And so those macro risks are substantial, uh, especially if in a developing country where you have disproportionately large amount of assets in these coins versus the local currency. Uh, fire sales, we just talked about that as a, as a huge risk. Uh, the uh, ability of the GSC to sell reserve assets at large volume. So you, you take a stable coin that has, you know, 50 billion, 100 billion, a trillion, and you know, in the next five years, we're going to see it, right? We're going to see a trillion dollar stable coin. You know, that, that means it's backed by a trillion dollars in treasuries. Well, if there's a run on that stable coin, how does the 
the the entity get out uh, from of those reserves. Um, and interestingly enough, and in tying into another video we're going to do on one of the Bitcoin ETFs, you can see how they have to disclose that some of the risks of of dealing with the value, some of the risks of that instrument, just like the risk of the GSC, is the inability to easily and quickly liquidate the reserve to convert the user back, you know, ultimately into cash. You know, the ultimate risk off asset globally. Um, blah, 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 prudential fragilities, big deal. The degree of vulnerability of a GSC to shocks it also depends on the operational resilience between the wallets and the exchanges, including standard and fallback arrangements. So if the GSC maybe allows a, a fiat off-ramp or a fiat on-ramp through one exchange agent or one bank, that is a huge counterparty risk because you create a bottleneck. And if that and if that entity that is you know crypto adjacent fails, and that is your critical path as the GSC owner for getting to cash or getting into another currency, if that's cut off and there's not a reliable fallback exchange or other method, then um, you know, you're gonna have people on the phones trying to like figure out, hey, how can I get out of this? And all of a sudden it's like the 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 peg is blown, the risk is through the roof. Uh, and uh again, depending on how widespread the adoption of the stable coin, you could see the whole thing just fall apart. Um, so table two here talks about the different risks, the capacity of the network to validate and process large volumes of transactions, huge deal. Again, this is kind of like the opposite of the reserve issue. It's like, what if you just have some, you know, a large group of people that want to move a large amount of the stable coin um, into another asset or across the network? Can the network handle the load? Blockchain is a very efficient and very costly database. Um, and if you were to jam a trillion dollars in transactions broken across, say, five or 10 million transactions simultaneously into the system, it's highly likely that it will hiccup. Um, anyone that's ever used MetaMask and just tried to, you, you know, or Gnosis Wallet and just tried to even simple multi-sig transactions know that the thing could get hung up. Can you imagine, you know, you're a uh, a non-bank lender and you're trying to send, you know, 2 billion in stable coin uh, through and distribute it to 10 parties or something. I mean, it, it would be a nightmare, but that's the key here is that if, if is that, is that what the FSB is saying and, and what they're, they're really pushing for. And even Basel to a certain extent, these global entities are saying, look, you have to prepare for the possibility that you're going to see a lot of stuff jam through at once. And how are you mitigating that risk? Where is it written? Give me the strategy. Give me the players involved. Have you tested it? How reliable is it? Are you going to keep it up? Are you going to maintain? Are you going to continue to, to find other backups? These are the questions that if you're doing a risk assessment on a stable coin, you need to ask and have documented proof of. It's time consuming, but certainly if you're, you know, you do not want to expose your users and in, in, in the case of a government, your users are all your citizens to this risk unnecessarily. Always go back to why blockchain, right? Why blockchain? Um, okay, FSB coverage, right? The serve. Oh, so here you go. So this is interesting. So now we're into the existing regulatory supervisor and oversight approaches and challenges. Now, hopefully, you saw how the stability issue works out, right? If the if the reserve redemption doesn't work really well, if the network fails, if there's a lack of security, you're going to have financial insecurity, the potential for runs, and I think that's the biggest risk is really the potential for runs on traditional financial institutions that are disproportionately exposed to the risk of a GSC um, and a lack of regulation uh, native to the, the user base. Here, uh, the existing regulatory and supervisor approaches and challenges were documented, and it found that most of the people that surveyed said that um, they don't have uh, specific crypto assets, and definitely not stable coins, and this is in 2020, um, portions of their government. They don't, they don't have like a part of the, you know, in the US, it's not like the office, office of the comptroller or the currency has a blockchain and crypto group. Um, they might have a group, but they don't have a specific division like the SEC that is just looking at crypto. And so uh, the other uh, thing you find with that is that even if the countries were like, no, we don't have a specific group that deals with these particular assets, they're not um, shy about saying that, well, our existing rules cover it. So if it, you know, we have these other esoteric assets, there's rules in place. Um, I think the short sightedness there, and again, this is 2020, is that like managing how like famous works of art get custodied and transferred and used for payments is a lot different than something that, you know, someone in their basement can mint 
claim is stable and then push out the door. Um, so there, there is inconsistency with how the different jurisdictions in 2020 were, were thinking about the need for unique legislation over crypto assets. Um, and it's still unclear here in the U.S., um, where that shakes out, you know, I, I, obviously the SEC is constantly in the news trying to claim some sort of territory uh, and also demarcate where they begin, where they end. We've seen the FD, FDIC and the OCC come out when it comes to stable coins. We know there's some bills in Congress. So we're, we're getting better about recognizing this particular industry and asset class for its own unique risks. Uh, but you know, if we're the best, like if we're the most advanced, which we're probably not, we're probably behind the EU and maybe some small uh, jurisdictions like Gibraltar, Singapore, et cetera, um, then this is not, you know, it's not looking good for our heroes. And, and we're probably going to see a lot more uh, kind of like calamitous events happen in the digital asset space uh, until there's a sort of universal level of heightened regulatory, call it commonality, uh, and and just acknowledgement that some sort of special entity within the governments um, has to have some, you know, either a supervisory role, you know, maybe give them some some uh, actual authority, uh, but but somewhere this all has to come to a nexus. Do 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 deposits. So and then also talks about the definition of stable coins, right? That the challenge was, you know, the term stable coin. Even now, it's not consistent. So like, the in some jurisdictions, a stable coin might qualify as e money, but in, in other cases, it may not. And so like certain claims against the assets that are backing the stable coin um, may not actually. Uh, work in different jurisdictions. So uh, that is definitely a gap. Um, and then the gap in the uh, approaches, if the GSE falls exclusively under securities regulation in a jurisdiction, activities related to the transfer of the coins may not be covered. So in the US, for instance, you have, you know, uh, MTLs, money transmitter licenses and MSBs, but then you also have securities uh, transfer requirements and broker dealer and RIA requirements. And the idea here is that what the FSB found out is in their survey, if a particular characteristic of a crypto asset or a stable coin falls under the jurisdiction of, say, the securities group, the, the banking and money transfer entity may not have may, may not have any say at that point, that the securities group has now jurisdiction. Now, that might not seem like a bad thing, right, to say, okay, great, we only have one regulator we're dealing with. But if you think about the principal... Um, you know, safety and soundness that one of these uh, regulators is really focused on, right? So the SEC wants to make sure that, you know, what's a security, what's not a security, who's custodying, who's buying, who's selling on behalf of who, they're less concerned about, like, if I send value from Florida to Texas, um, what are all the what are all the regs and rules to make sure that the transfer from Florida to Texas is happening uh, safely and soundly? The securities people would ignore that, um, and so that's actually a gap, right? So that like the entity that claims to have absolute authority over, say, stable coins, they themselves may not cover all the different things that stable coins can impact, and so here they're recommending rec regulations coordination between those entities so that even if one does claim, say, jurisdiction, not to use the term, uh, you know, too specifically here, but if like the SEC claims jurisdiction over a stable coin, but there are aspects of the stable coin that impact banking, that the banking regulators do get to to kind of cover that that territory, just kind of common sense. But something again, you know, no one, you know, believe me, it's government employees all over the world. Just like here, they're not raising their hand asking for more work. So you almost need regulation enforcing those groups, you know, that force those groups to um, proactively reach out to the entity taking ownership and saying, hey, that's my part of the puzzle. Let me contribute uh, guidance here. Um, incomplete or non-existing implementation of standards inability to effectively supervise, like we just talked about, multiple entities, who's in charge, uh, incomplete coverage of the functions, right? So trading versus wallet services, custody versus not custody, consumer protection, and then cybersecurity. I mean, these, 
cybersecurity and the SEC are like two totally different areas, right? And they're saying that, look, this is happening all over the world. And that as a result, there's insufficient risk mitigation tools uh, that, that, you know, that cover all these different aspects. And those risk mitigation tools, unfortunately, they come with a price. They got to be designed. They got to be built. They got to be tested. They got to maintain. They got to be updated. So you have the, these cost centers associated with it, which which can be borne by the GSC issuer, right? But that means the GSC issuer has to make money off the reserve. It has to make money off the transfer. And then, then it has to use that money to pay for this oversight. And then all of a sudden now, are you really a stable coin or are you a securities offering? Uh, are you really a stable coin? because not for nothing, um, I know you're saying it's worth a buck, but it costs you money to manage this. So is it really 98 cents? Um, and then competition policies, such as making sure that like um, you don't get everybody sucked into the same stable coin and, uh, you know, have a monopolization, essentially a, a private enterprise printing money alongside, uh, you know, the government. Crazy. So international standards, Basel Committee, we'll talk about that in other videos, the FATF we've spoken about that having to do with really uh, AML and KYC and VASPs, so that's the FATF's focus. Um, and then here, the CPMI and the IOS, IOSCO, uh, their focus had to do with um, risks to the broader financial system and operational resilience. So more with the storage and transfer of the asset as opposed to the reserve mechanism, but also hugely important. Um, here, the IOSCO uh, also talked about doing a life cycle analysis for the hypothetical stablecoin used for domestic and cross-border payments, uh, which is interesting because the U.S. rating agencies um, have come out and said that's how they approach their risk assessing of these crypto tokens is by looking at a full life cycle analysis, the minting, the burning, the paperwork, the reserves, the use case, the the um, whatever you call it, uh, when there's damage, uh, uh, loss mitigation strategies, et cetera. Uh, but these are all challenges that are particularly significant, again, to those emerging com countries, because um, oftentimes you'll see cases where folks in emerging and developed countries have uh, members of family or friends or work or what have you outside their jurisdiction. And if they rely on, on GSCs uh, for payments and, and transfers, et cetera, uh, then there's a disproportionate risk to the citizens of the EMDE versus, say, a developed country where all that stuff might happen within the borders of, of the country. So, so the rules and regulations, as long as they're good in that country, um, provide sufficient protection. So again, disproportionate risk to the the most disenfranchised people not good cross border competition again these things are all the same use governance issuance transfer and user facing elements it's the same the the same issues that plague within a country uh the regulations that have to be provided the same thing happens with international payments and the ability to supervise uh, one of the challenges that they raise up is this notion of a home supervisor, right? That there's a supervisor in the jurisdiction where the parent entity uh, of the financial institution that creates the GSC is located um, and how that home supervisor cooperates with supervisors in other jurisdictions or branches of uh, host supervisors um, is not codified anywhere. And, and there were, maybe for certain as asset classes, but certainly not for global stable coins, because you also have to identify experts in the stable coin at those, in those government channels. And for the most part, those people already have jobs. So unless you're going to go out and hire specific government officials to, to be the host supervisor that has to like beg, borrow and steal from the home supervisor for data, uh, Unless, uh, there, there needs to be a law, right? There needs to be laws that are enforced, right? That's the first bullet point. Remember the first bullet point? The laws have to be enforced. So if there are laws written up where the home supervisor is forced to feed information to the host supervisor, then you have to have the carrot and the stick, right? So the incentive is, you know, you pay the guy or gal. 
the, the stick is, is that if they don't comply with sharing that information to those other uh, jurisdictions, then certainly that person needs to be removed and, and even possible penalties, because you are talking about a negligent act on the part of a home supervisor that willingly withholds information that would, uh, that would help a host supervisor protect the people in its jurisdiction. Hugely important. Um, the arrangement may be, the stablecoin arrangement could be a network of unrelated entities. So this is when you talk about the actual execution and management of the stablecoin, because we are talking about decentralized ledger technology, uh, somehow ring fencing the functions and activities from the various jurisdictions. You may even have where the reserves are managed in this country and the tokens minted and printed in this country uh, and, and what that cross-border governance looks like. So not even just where everything is parked in one home state. Very unique challenge. Uh, responsibility E, I just circled this because this was something that came up. You might hear it, that central banks, market regulators, and other relevant authorities should cooperate with each other domestically and internationally as appropriate in promoting the safety and efficiency of the FMIs, of the financial institutions. Okay, different groups, high-level recommendations, and I think this is where we call it. Yeah, so do do do. Here's a nice little table. I'll leave this up while I give my concluding thoughts for two seconds. The uh, the idea here of the FSB in 2020. Grab a screenshot. I'll pause. Good. The the idea behind these regulatory guidelines was clearly to create a framework. You know, the, the G20 asked, the FSB delivered. They surveyed, they gathered information, they compiled the risks, and then they push it back to the G20 that the G20 then distributes to the different countries and says, okay, regulators, this, this is something that you need to address and how are you doing on this? This is a snail's process. This is the last half of the decade where we're gonna see these global regulations put out for comment, brought back, minted, tweaked, et cetera. The good news is, is that progress is forward, right? So this isn't a recommendation to get rid of global stable coins, right? This is a recommendation to uh, ensure that safety and soundness principles across the different aspects of the token are respected and um, just love seeing that. So um, again, I wanna thank you for your time today, for for hearing me out. If you're on your car, you're working out, uh, this, is, this is, I'm sure, exciting information for you. Um, be sure to like and subscribe. Click the little button here. There's more stuff in the library and more content coming out. Again, Howard Krieger, not an attorney, not a lawyer, just somebody in the industry trying to share a little knowledge. Have a great day and until next time, bye-bye.